Doing a GPU roundup is difficult this year as chaos in pricing has thrown off easy price comparisons. It also becomes difficult because many of the direct matchups are close when based on MSRP, but get thrown off when looking at available prices. There's the additional challenge too of specific games performing better on one brand than another, which is pretty standard across all years. So you'll ultimately have to exercise your own thoughts and look at the current market after the video goes live even to determine how the video cards stack up versus when they did when we posted the video. As always, links will be below to the reviews for each product and for the individual products if you would like to buy them. Before getting to that, this content is brought to you by the Thermaltake Flow RGB closed loop liquid cooler, which is a 360 millimeter radiator plus three 120 fans that are RGB illuminated. The Thermaltake rain fans at that. This is a 4.5 gen Azatec pump, which is one of the faster pumps. You can learn more at the link in the description below. So as with the previous roundups, we're looking at only the products we reviewed. Fortunately, we've basically reviewed every video card on the market this year. There are a lot of them though. So we're not gonna talk about every single device. We'll go over the most important ones for our gaming market audience. And uh, then of course, again, some of these conclusions will vary based on the price of the card. So we'll try and make it so that you can take the, the conclusions and then factor it towards however the price is modified when you end up going to buy the thing. Uh, and finally, we're going to be limiting the amount of data here because it's a roundup. So if you want all of the charts, thermals, power, noise, all the games, all that stuff, check the individual reviews. They'll be linked below. And keep in mind that the most recent review will have the most recent data because as drivers update, as new games come out, obviously the numbers change. Uh, so the most recent review would be the 1070 Ti, which is the one we'd point you toward for the most recent data set. That said, we're going to be looking at mostly percentages today rather than flat out FPS numbers because we're doing matchups in each price category. So it'll be a straight percentage performance with a 100% baseline. So the top performing card will be 100% on the chart and then the next card, its competitor, will be whatever percentage it is behind the 100% mark for what is effectively full speed. So let's get started with Vega 56 and the 1070, work our way down, and then we'll come back to the high end. In our Vega 56 review, the TLDR version was that the card, if it could be found at its MSRP of $400 or reasonably close to 1070 prices, made a whole lot of sense. We later revisited Vega 56 in our hybrid mod, where we applied power play tables, 400 watts worth of power, a 360 millimeter radiator, and pushed it to the absolute limits. The result was obviously higher performance as expected, but also completely blowing out the power efficiency. That wasn't the point though. The point was that you can push Vega 56 pretty far and basically outperform or equate Vega 64 in most scenarios. The mod was impractical to some extent, but again, there's a lot of room to play with Vega 56 and that proved that. In terms of gaming performance, the GTX 1070 and Vega 56 cards are reasonably close to their matchups. This is a chart of relative average FPS performance and shows that the GTX 1070 SC leads primarily in Ghost Recon and For Honor, while Vega 56 leads in the rest. So that would be DirectX 12 and Vulcan titles mostly. These numbers are what precipitated the launch of the GTX 1070 Ti. Vega 56 has a wider spread of games here where it wins and has a price which is theoretically lower. And here's a chart of power performance. The GTX 1070 is much more efficient but not in a way that makes Vega 56 significantly worse for room ambient or for the power bill in most places. If these numbers do concern you, either because your electricity costs more or you don't have AC or something like that, well, your choice has been made or you need to look a bit further into the impact of the difference. If not, we're still supporting Vega 56 as a buy, but only if it's under GTX 1070 Ti prices. We should also note that the reference blower performs poorly, like always, even with Nvidia cards, despite having an excellently built PCB and VRM for Vega 56. In fact, it's the same as Vega Frontier Edition, which shipped at about $1,000. You'll want to either mod the card, which adds cost, or wait for partner models. The reference model is loud, as you can see in our RPM to noise response chart here, and pushes high temperatures across the entire board. Vega is sensitive to those high temperatures, just like Pascal, and so you'll have direct clock benefit from a better cooling solution and is the single biggest point against Vega 56 right now until partner models come out. To learn more about Vega, undervolting, overclocking, and more, click our reviews linked in the description below. You can also find a purchase link to Vega 56 if you like, along with a link to an air cooler mod that pretty much fixes the problem. So that had Vega 56 generally preferable over the GTX 1070. 
Here's a look at how the 1070 Ti changed the game. We're starting with non-overclocked numbers, but we'll get to overclocking because it does matter. Without an overclock, running the reference clocks, because that's what Nvidia enforced on manufacturers, we're already running the GTX 1070 Ti at anywhere from 89 to 98.4% of the GTX 1080 performance. RX Vega 56 is listed strictly for perspective, operating at 74% to 88% of the GTX 1080. Remember, this is not percent performance of the 1070 Ti for Vega 56, but of the 1080. We're scaling versus a baseline of 100% for the 1080 again, to be very clear. The GTX 1070 Ti is a 1080 with one less SM, just like the 1063 gigabyte is a 1066 gigabyte with one less SM. The difference amounts to one of clocks more than shaders, as we'll show on this overclocking chart, and the GDDR5X of the 1080 isn't really missed on the 1070 Ti. A lot of folks jumped on the bandwagon that the 1070 Ti is a pointless card, but ever since launch, we've mostly disagreed with some of that rhetoric. The GTX 1070 Ti, even before an overclock, largely invalidates the more expensive GTX 1080s, not the other way around. At $50 cheaper on average, the 1070 Ti provides 90 to 98% of the performance when stock, and mostly achieves parity when both are overclocked. Unless you can find a GTX 1080 on sale for under 500, or unless the 1070 Ti's end up around the $480 plus range exclusively, we think that the 1070 Ti makes more sense presently than the more expensive 1080s. You can save a few bucks, and as we showed in our recent man vs machine overclocking, you can get back some performance with 15 minutes of overclocking work. Power consumption isn't even that different, as you'd expect, and that's because it's the same silicon. So, to recap, everything depends on price. At price parity, or favor toward Vega 56, we're recommending Vega 56 over the 1070 non-TI. At a price advantage of $40 to $50 over the GTX 1080, we're recommending a 1070 Ti and maybe a short overclock. Under $500, we're recommending the 1080s. And this is, of course, assuming that the individual models are actually good and not just some more rebranded blower garbage cards. Before getting into all of the mid-range hardware that includes AMD, we're first addressing the differences between the 1063 gigabyte and 6 gigabyte cards because this came out a while ago. As a recap, we concluded our GTX 1063 gigabyte card review by declaring that it should have been named the 1050 Ti. This is, I think, before the 1050 Ti existed. The card doesn't just have the VRAM, it removes one SM, or simultaneous multiprocessor, from the GPU, reducing core count by 10%. Base clock is the same between them, but the core count and memory capacity are both lower. As for what this means for FPS, it really depends on what game you're playing. Here's the relative performance for average FPS across several games. The GTX 1066GB card is represented at 100% and runs at the same clock as the 3GB card. For the most part, the GTX 1063GB card always maintains at least 88% of the performance of the 6, with its average performance closer to 92-93% to of the total 1066GB performance. Scalability gets a bit rough when blasting VRAM, but we're more likely to become bound by ROPs or cores and clocks before becoming bound by VRAM. There are a few games where frame time consistency dips at higher texture qualities, represented by our 1% and 0.1% low converted FPS values. The 1% lows are mostly consistent with the average, as shown in this chart, and we tend to sit between 88% and 95% of total performance potential. The 0.1% lows, shown in this chart, are also largely consistent, except more VRAM abusive games like Mordor drag us down to 70% of total performance potential. Fortunately, although occasionally noticeable, this isn't generally experience ruining. And also generally speaking, if the two cards cost the same, the 6GB version is going to be a better buy. They generally don't cost the same though, and if the price gap nears $40 to $50, it may be better to buy the 3GB version, unless you're running specific applications that are VRAM intensive. For anyone attempting to make the argument that higher capacity will last longer for games in the long run, keep in mind that, again, we're more likely to become bound by ROPs or core count or frequency prior to becoming memory bound. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, we can turn toward the RX 580 and GTX 1060 comparisons. As a refresher, the RX 580 uses the same Polaris GPU as the RX 480, and it was functionally a refresh. The card significantly increased power consumption over the RX 480 and the GTX 1060, with improvement only to idle power consumption versus the 480. This was a launch where AMD and its board partners opted to blast the Polaris clock, effectively pre-overclocking the cards and increasing the voltage going to the core, which gave that extra clock headroom. The result was a highly competitive product with the GTX 1060 when looking at gaming performance, but higher power draw as a result. Whether that's relevant, we'll leave up to you. 
As for the average gaming performance, the GTX 1060 and RX 580 trade back and forth. The award for, quote, best gets passed between them largely depending on game, with Nvidia generally pulling ahead in DirectX 11 titles and AMD generally pulling ahead in Vulkan or DirectX 12, these results are somewhat expected based on what we know of the architectures. The RX 580 has room to play with overclocking and undervolting, making it a good option for people who don't mind being under the hood, so to speak. The trouble is availability and price, as ever. If you can find these cards at price parity, we recommend picking based on a per game performance look. Figure out which has the performance most representative of the titles you intend to play, and then consider power consumption for the Nvidia argument, or consider FreeSync for the AMD argument, and pick primarily based on price and availability afterward. This discussion does overlook the RX 570 though. We found the RX 570 to be one of the most promising launches of the 500 series. The 570 cards have been difficult to get near MSRP since launch, and that problem was exacerbated with the mining trend. If you can find one below RX 580 prices, ideally around $180, then we still like the RX 570. Much like Vega 56 and Vega 64, this difference is one of shaders, and most games favor the clock difference on AMD cards over the shader difference. You can easily compensate in most titles by overclocking an RX 570, and it's much more worthwhile as a purchase than the GTX 1050 Ti, which costs $150 to $170. That said, it has to be available at 180. Once the RX 570 goes above that, the argument gets a bit weak for its price to performance. The GTX 1050 Ti is, however, one of the few cards that, for a few months this year, was left untouched by miners, making it an odd, unexpected anchor for cheap gaming PCs. We never fully recommended the 1050 Ti. The RX 570 was much better at the high end, then before that the 470, and the 1050 or RX 560 fulfilled the low end. It wasn't until the GPU shortage that the 1050 Ti developed more value, and that's mostly solved by now. Moving on to low-end GPUs, we now look at the RX 560 and GTX 1050 cards. At present, the RX 560 ranges from $110 to $140. To save everyone some time, the $140 units are a ripoff. Don't bother. The only challenger to this level of worthlessness is the GTX 1050 at $150. Also a ripoff. The Ti, by the way, is not too distant from that. So we're not talking about the 1050 Ti at 150. We're talking about the 1050 and the RX 560 at 140 to 150. Ignoring the overpriced units, the more reasonably priced GTX 1050s cost between $112 and $120, with the more reasonably priced RX 560s around $110 after rebate, if you count those toward price, or $124 flat. These cards should both be close to $100 ideally, but the GPU market behavior has also affected the low end, unfortunately. We'll make do with what we have though. Looking at the average performance chart, the GTX 1050 maintains a lead in the same games as the previous pairings, Ghost Recon and For Honor representing our DX11 tests, with Firestrike representing one half of the synthetics. The lead tends to be in the range of 8 percentage points. The RX 560, meanwhile, maintains a lead in Time Spy, a significant lead in Doom, and another significant lead in Sniper, with small leads in Ashes. When the RX 460 launched, it was a bad purchase compared to the 1050, flat out. The RX 560 changed that and showed performance advantages in DirectX 12 and Vulkan titles, and some gains in DirectX 11 thanks to the extra clocks. The 560 doesn't have huge deficit versus the 1050 and DirectX 11 anymore. The deficits are workable and even recoverable with an overclock, but it maintains large leads in DirectX 12 and Vulkan APIs that we've tested. Not shown in these charts, but shown in our review charts, the RX 560 also maintains more consistent frame time performance in some games, partly thanks to its 4GB frame buffer. As with other cards, it comes down to price. At price parity, our pick is the RX 560, but we'd like to see the 560 closer to $110, and we'd like to see the 1050 closer to $100, but there's not much we can do about that. And at the high end, it's the GTX 1080 Ti. There's no head-to-head -head matchup here because there's no head-to-head -head competition. We have plenty of videos on the 1080 Ti's. In fact, we have a roundup of 1080 Ti's, which we did separately strictly because there's no competition, so you're just picking between them. So if you want to learn more about that card, check our 1080 Ti roundup. Uh, as for other devices, so things to know. Uh, we have a strong stance of don't buy for two cards on the market right now. One of them is Vega 64. We think it's a bad purchase. If you can spend a few minutes doing just even an HBM overclock on Vega 56. You don't even have to flash the BIOS. Just a, a basic overclock on 56 largely invalidates 64. If you're comfortable with flashing the BIOS, 
you can gain back even more of that performance delta. The only thing you're going to be missing is the shaders, but you can get back the clocks. They overclock about the same, technically with Vega 56 taking a slight lead because the extra heat generated by the extra shaders on Vega 64. So don't buy a 64. The price is not good. 56 is the same card, just slightly fewer shaders, and the shader difference doesn't really matter. Uh, and it's a much better deal, and if you overclock it, you basically just got yourself a 64 for much cheaper. The other card we have a strong don't buy stance on is the Titan XP. This one's a bit weird. For gaming, the Titan XP is invalidated by the 1080 Ti. The difference between them, there are a couple differences, but the main one's one gigabyte of video memory. And that difference is primarily beneficial from what we understand for users of deep learning setups, machine learning, uh, things like that. We actually worked with one of the users who purchased the Titan XP for the purpose of machine learning, noting that the extra gigabyte mattered a lot for his particular data set size. So for most of our audience being gamers, there's no real point to buy it. Get a 1080 Ti if you want something that high end. You don't even have to overclock it. Some of the AIB partner 1080 Ti's will outperform a Titan XP out of the box. So uh, those are the two we'd say don't buy. Vega FE also, I guess, it's been on sale for $700 lately. That doesn't mean you should buy it because it's still Vega 64 and 56 just with more VRAM. And unless you know you're going to use that and you know who you are, if you will use it, then there's not much value in it. And you now have to deal with the difference in the drivers, being the pro drivers uh, and, thin, and dual drivers and things like that. Uh, the rest, though, we've got a lineup here that we just went through for all the cards and what to buy at each category. So hopefully that helps you. As always, we have a lot more content coming. Subscribe for all of that. You can help us out directly on patreon.com slash gamersnexus, or you can pick up a shirt like this one or one of our stickers on store.gamersnexus.net, where a lot of them are presently on sale for the holidays. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.